Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm the Gryffindorable host, Ellen, and the Slytherin appropriate host is Katie. Hey, don't make me slither my foot into your ass. You are just proving my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just keep rolling into the rolling rehash. Last week, we covered Chapter 19, The Hungarian Horn Tale, and the corresponding film scenes that happened completely out of order. Harry discovered that the only thing more exciting than a heart-to-heart with his dog father is the possibility of pissing off Filch with a nose full of dung bomb. What we had previously only suspected about Rita and her trash journalism was confirmed by the finished article about Harry and the other champions, whoever they are. Pansy Parkinson has yet to learn that people with pug faces shouldn't throw insults. In the book, Hagrid delivers his own messages, but the movie has Hermione play telephone with Ron and Harry just to get the same point across, leading Harry to tell Hermione to tell Ron that he sucks. Romanian dragon keepers aren't clever enough to keep the fire-breathing dragons away from the super-flammable trees. And the movie scene starts where the book chapter ends. Flaming Gary Oldman! During episode 85, The Ban, we had two Potter Ponderings. Our first one was, what do you think about Charlie Weasley being left out of the films completely? Juliana said she would have loved to see Charlie Weasley. He had a good bit to do in this book as well as Philosopher slash Sorcerer's Stone. It's a shame he was cut out. Dave said, Charlie who? Peeves' imaginary brother? Wait, Peeves who? Oh, Ed Sheeran. <laughs> Mike said, as we all know by now, he hates every change from the books to the movies on principle and would 100% sit through an ages-long cinematic version of the word-for-word book adaptation. As for Charlie, he's so cool in the books and really just helps flesh out how awesome the Weasleys are. Like, they're all pretty unique personality-wise, but all such good people at the same time. Except Percy. He's a git. Robert said as cool as it would be to see Charlie, he feels like his exclusion is the same as Peeves. In the books, when he shows up, he isn't really there to drive the plot forward and wouldn't have had so much to do in the movies. Carly says she loves Charlie. He's her favorite Weasley. It was so disappointing for them to not even try. She hated him basically being forgotten completely. So upsetting. Jackson said... Charlie, Charlie, oh, you mean Ed Sheeran. But seriously, the fact that Charlie wasn't in the movie just seriously pisses him off. He looked forward to seeing both Bill and Charlie when Goblet of Fire came out, but no. Charlie is just mentioned, and Bill comes into Deathly Hollows engaged to flirt with zero explanation and a shitty, hurried introduction. He wanted to see Charlie explain the dragons warn Hagrid not to touch the eggs, and even wanted to hear him do the imitation of his mum reading the Rita Skeeter article. All of which would have been amazing. Mm Mm-hmm. Our other Potter pondering was, what do you think about how the movies portrayed the head in the fireplace? Juliana said that the head in the fire was not at all how she pictured it. She pictured it more like a face in smoke rather than the burning embers. Dave said the first time he saw the head-slash-face in the fire, it took him a while to see that it was a head-slash-face. He heard the voice but didn't see where it was coming from. Then he realized it was in the coals. He was not a fan of how the movie did it, and he still has a hard time recognizing that it's actually serious. Mike said for the fire, he thought it was pretty good, but he doesn't know why they had the head made out of pieces of fire rather than just being in the fireplace. Like, creative license, but so unnecessary. Robert said when it comes to flu powder in the movies, it was great in Goblet of Fire, but completely butchered in the fifth movie by having it more like a screen inside of the ashes. He would have personally liked it more if it was just a slightly greenish-tinged floating head. Carly said she also hates the way the head is portrayed in the movie. 
Like, his face is coals, and it gives her the heebie-jeebies. Which, I gotta say, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Jackson said, as for the fireplace, yeah, that was stupid. If it weren't for the voice, you wouldn't have even known it was serious. Even the way they did it in Order of the Phoenix, which just looked like a video projection onto the flames, was crap. You're telling me they couldn't CGI Sirius's head into the fire? Very valid point. Right? Mm-hmm. Lots of good points here. We yeah. love getting your opinions. Yeah, really. Our trivia question last week was, what spell does Harry use to split Cedric Diggory's bag? To stop Cedric from getting too far away and separate him from his friends, Harry cast Defendo on Cedric's bag, causing his parchment, quills, and books to spill out everywhere, but also giving Harry the opportunity to tell him about the dragons for the first task. Congratulations goes to Mike Riley. Yay! He is building his streak back up. This makes six weeks in a row. If he gets this week, he's back to one week away from tiling the record, which is the furthest he's ever made it. Yep, twice now he's made it to seven weeks. We'll see if he does it again. And if maybe this time he will actually beat the freaking record, jeez. For now, let's just keep rolling into the first half of Chapter 20, the first task, and the corresponding film scenes. Chapter 20, the first task, part one. When Harry wakes up that Sunday morning, he's extremely distracted and struggles to get dressed before finally managing it and hurrying off to find Hermione. He locates her in the Great Hall eating breakfast with Ginny and waits for her to finish without eating anything himself. He drags her out onto the grounds and during a long walk around the lake, he tells her all about the dragons and everything Sirius had said. Hermione says that they should focus on Harry making it through the task and then they can worry about Karkaroff. After three walks around the lake and no ideas for a simple spell that could subdue a dragon, they decide to head to the library. Harry pulls every book he can find about dragons, but they can't find anything helpful, so they switch to simple spell books. Hermione talks out loud to herself the entire time she's reading and trying to come up with a solution, until Harry grits his teeth and asks her to shut up for a bit so he can concentrate. She does but this just lets Harry's brain fill with a blank buzzing that he also finds extremely distracting. They're interrupted by the arrival of Victor Crumb, closely followed by his entourage of giggling girls, and decide to head back to their common room. Harry barely sleeps that night and wakes up Monday morning seriously considering running away from Hogwarts, though he could never really do it since Hogwarts is the only place he ever remembers being happy. It actually helps him feel slightly calmer to know that he would rather be at Hogwarts facing a dragon than back at Privet Drive with Dudley, and he even manages to eat some breakfast. As he and Hermione get up from the table, he also notices Cedric Diggory leaving the Hufflepuff table. It occurs to Harry that Cedric is the only champion who didn't know about the dragons, assuming that Madame Maxime and Karkaroff told Fleur and Crumb. He tells Hermione that he will meet her at the greenhouses and hurries after Cedric. By the time he catches him, he's with a load of sixth-year friends, so he aims his wand and carefully says Defendo. Cedric's bag splits open and his school supplies spill everywhere. He sends his friends on to let Flitwick know why he's delayed, and once they're alone in the corridor, Harry takes the opportunity to tell him that the first task is dragons. Cedric is shocked and asks if he's sure, and wonders how he found out. Harry tells him never mind and just explains that he is sure Fleur and Crumb will know too. Cedric doesn't know why Harry's telling him about it, and Harry tells him that it's just fair, so now they all know and are on even footing. They're interrupted by Professor Moody, who sends Diggory off and asks Potter to follow him into his office. Harry is worried he will be in trouble, but instead Moody quietly tells him that he did a very decent thing. He invites Harry to sit down, and Harry does, looking around the office, which looks very different from its two previous occupants. Moody watches as Harry examines the odd objects around and asks Harry if he likes his dark detectors. Harry asks what a humming, squiggly, golden aerial is and learns that it's a secrecy sensor that vibrates when it detects concealment and lies. Moody explains that it's of no use at Hogwarts since there's too much interference from students in every direction lying about homework and whatnot. Harry then inquires about a mirror and Moody tells him that it's a faux glass. He gestures to the shadowy figure moving in sight and says that he isn't really in trouble until he can see the whites of their eyes 
and that's when he opens his trunk. Harry looks over at the large trunk Moody points at. It has seven keyholes in a row, and he wonders what's in it, before Moody mentions that he found out about the dragons. Harry tries to explain that he didn't cheat, but Moody is unconcerned and says he's been telling Dumbledore from the start that Karkaroff and Maxime will not be as high-minded because they want to win. He gives a harsh laugh as he says they want to beat Dumbledore and prove he's only human. He then asks Harry if he has any idea how he's going to get past his dragon, and when Harry says no, he tells him to play to his strengths. Before he can stop himself, Harry blurts that he hasn't got any, and Moody insists that he does, telling him to think what he's best at. Harry tells him that it's Quidditch, but he doesn't see how that will help him since he's not allowed a broom. Moody then advises Harry to use a nice simple spell that enables him to get what he needs, and encourages him to think it through. After a few seconds, it clicks for Harry. He needs his firebolt, and to get that, he needs to learn how to do the summoning charm. He passes this information on to Hermione, and the two practice during every free moment, even skipping lunch. Harry wants to skip divination to keep practicing, but Hermione refuses to skip arithmancy, so he goes to class and has to listen to Trelawney predict that he was in danger of sudden violent death. He spends the rest of the lesson trying to summon small things and maybe even succeeded with a fly. After divination, he forces down some dinner and he and Hermione head back to an empty classroom with the invisibility cloak to keep practicing. Just past midnight, Peeves shows up and starts throwing things at them, so they head back to the common room, which is now empty, and allows them to keep practicing in peace. By two in the morning, Harry finally has the hang of the charm and is surrounded by a heap of objects he had summoned. Hermione is very tired, but pleased with Harry's progress, and she thinks he will be fine for the next day, as long as he concentrates really hard. She says they better get some sleep, and the two head to bed. The movie section starts out on a badge that says, Support Cedric Diggory, before it spins and changes to say, Harry Potter stinks. The camera then switches to show Harry walking through the Hogwarts Courtyard corridor while being taunted by people with more of the Potter stinks badges. Harry attempts to walk into the courtyard, but is blocked by a couple of students. The boy asks if Harry likes the badge, as he gestures to it, and the girl laughs. Harry says, excuse me, and when they just continue to laugh at him, he just pushes his way through and walks across the grass to where Cedric is lying on a bench surrounded by some friends. He sits up as his friends react to Harry's arrival and agrees to have a word with him when he asks. Harry leads him away from his friends who are also laughing about the badges and call after Harry that he stinks. Cedric looks back at them and laughs a little too, but still follows Harry to a more private section of the courtyard. Harry faces him and informs him that dragons are the first task, that they've got one for each of them. Cedric looks concerned and is slightly distracted by one of his friends yelling his name, but then looks back at Harry and asks if he is serious. Harry nods and Cedric wonders if Fleur and Crumb know too. Harry confirms that as well, and the camera cuts to show Mad-Eye Moody watching from the courtyard corridor. Cedric's friends call for him again, saying they are leaving, and before he heads off, he tells Harry that he has asked them not to wear the badges. Harry tells him not to worry about it, and walks off just in time to see Ron and Seamus walking by. He marches right up to Ron and declares him to be a right foul git. Ron asks if he thinks so. Harry says he knows so, and Ron wants to know if he has anything else to say. Harry tells him to stay away from him, and Ron says fine, and walks off. A voice calls out to Harry, wondering why he's so tense, and the camera cuts to show Malfoy sitting in a tree. He tells Harry that he and his father have a bet, and he doesn't think he's going to last ten minutes in the tournament. He jumps down from the tree and adds that his father disagrees, because he doesn't think he will last five minutes. Harry firmly states that he doesn't give a damn what Malfoy's father thinks. He calls him vile and cruel and tells Draco that he's just pathetic before he turns to walk away. Draco reaches for his wand, but before he can cast a curse at Harry's back, Moody comes out into the open and hits him with a spell that turns him into a white ferret. Harry spins back around just in time to watch Moody repeatedly bounce Malfoy the ferret up into the air as he calls him cowardly and admonishes him for trying to attack someone behind their back. Crab and Goyle stand on either side of the ferret, watching as it moves up and down, while Harry laughs in the background. Professor McGonagall walks up, wondering what Professor Moody is doing, and is horrified when he responds that he is teaching, and she realizes that the ferret is a student. 
More students, including Cedric and his friends, gather around to laugh at the situation as Moody magics the ferret into Crab's pants. Crab freaks out and Goyle attempts to pull Malfoy the ferret out of Crab's pants and gets bit. Moody winks at Harry, who is cracking up, and as the ferret crawls out of Crab's pant leg, Professor McGonagall steps forward to return him to student form. The ferret spirals back into Malfoy, and he stands up with his blonde hair all must and tells Moody that his father will hear about this. Moody lunges towards him, wondering if that was a threat, and chases him around the tree as Professor McGonagall protests. He is yelling after Malfoy that he could tell him stories about his father that would curl even his greasy hair, when McGonagall steps in his path, points her wand in his face, and firmly reminds him that they never use transfiguration as a punishment, saying surely Professor Dumbledore told him that. He looks down at her wand and stubbornly says he might have mentioned it. She tells him that he would do well to remember it and whirls around to shoo away the other students as she walks away. Moody makes a face at her back and then limps past Harry, ordering him to come along. Harry hurries after him, and the scene transitions to them entering Professor Moody's office. Moody limps over to a chair and removes his prosthetic leg, sighing with relief. Harry looks around the office that is filled with many magical objects and hesitates as he sees a strange-looking mirror. Moody explains that it is a faux glass and lets him keep an eye on his enemies. If he can see the whites of their eyes... He knows that they are standing right behind him. Then a yell comes from an ornate dark metal trunk that shakes with the scream, prompting Moody to say he won't even bother telling him what's in there, because he wouldn't believe it if he did. He then changes the subject to ask what Harry is going to do about his dragon, and Harry stammers through, saying basically nothing at all, because he has no idea. Moody uses his good leg to push a stool forward, ordering Harry to sit. Harry takes a seat and listens as his professor explains that the other champions are skilled and will have strategies that play to their strengths. He asks Harry what his strengths are, and Harry responds that he's a fair flyer. Moody says better than fair the way he heard it, but Harry points out that he's not allowed a broom. Leaning forward, Moody very significantly points out that he is allowed a wand. So once again, we're looking at film scenes that correspond... Mm-hmm. Though I use that term very loosely. Yeah. For getting much of the same information across, it really is quite a bit different. This section also includes a scene that happened earlier in the book, so we'll be talking about that as well. Yeah. The book starts out with Harry waking up that Sunday morning so distracted he has trouble getting dressed. That makes sense. I've been there before, though. I get it. I've been there and I haven't needed to face a dragon later on that week or day. He finds Hermione in the Great Hall eating breakfast with Ginny and waits for her to finish but can't eat anything himself. And I've been there before too. Again, yes. I get it. He drags her out onto the grounds and tells her all about the dragons and everything that he learned from Sirius. And Hermione's just like, okay, one thing at a time. (laughs) Let's focus on you making it through the task alive. (laughs) Right. Then we're going to worry about Karkaroff. (laughs) They walk around the lake three times and don't have any like genius ideas of how he can do that. So Hermione's default. Let's go to the library. Unless you're watching the movie. (laughs) In which case, never shows Harry tell Hermione about the dragons or has her help him figure out how to get past one at all. Yeah. It's not even there. But in the book, in the book, however, yes. Harry pulls out every book that he can find about dragons, <laughs> except it's mostly like books written for nutters like Hagrid that actually want to take care of a dragon. And none of them are really about how to not be eaten or torched by a dragon. Which you would think that would be the topic of the day. You would think <laughs> the entire time Hermione's just talking out loud to herself. <laughs> like you could do this. You could, and I, I mean, I'm Hermione. I totally get that. Yeah. I also totally get how that can be really annoying. And I, anytime I'm in a room working with other people or working, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm so sorry. I'm having a conversation with myself. <laughs> and Harry ends up gritting his teeth and just being like, oh, my God, can you shut up? I need to concentrate. Not wrong. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and she shuts up. But then without her talking, his brain instead fills with like a very distracting, just buzzing sound. I imagine it's like dragon. <laughs> <laughs> And that doesn't help him focus at all either. I would imagine it wouldn't. But they end up being interrupted by Victor Crumb showing up. 
because he's taken to hanging out in the library for some reason. Hmm. What could that be? Wonder why. And Hermione's just like, we need to go because the girls are showing up next. And sure enough, this entourage of giggling girls just like, oh, he's so cute. (laughs) Oh, that would annoy me so much. Yeah. Especially if I'm legitimately in the library looking to... Look into library shit. Look into library, man. Fuck off. Let me library. Yeah, they end up deciding to head back to the common room. Mm -hmm. The movie does reference Karam's entourage, but it's later on and does not involve the library. But we'll talk more about that when we get there. Yeah. In the book, Harry can barely sleep that night. Again, understandable. Mm -hmm. And he wakes up Monday morning seriously considering running away from Hogwarts, though he does realize that he could never actually do that because Hogwarts is home. It is. Plus, where else is he going to go? Back to the Dursleys, which actually kind of calms him down. He's just like, I'd rather face a dragon than live with the Dursleys. Exactly. I'd rather face a dragon than hang out with Dudley. And he even manages to eat some breakfast. So that's a huge realization right there. Well, hey, that's quite a turn. There's another would you rather Potter pondering right there. Would you rather hang out with the Dursleys or face a dragon? See, I think that's actually kind of a tough one because... I might pick the Dursleys. I think it would be fun to give them a piece of my mind and less scary than a dragon, but I'm combative. I mean, I might just let death embrace me like an old friend. (laughs) I think I'd let the dragon kill me before I hung out with the Dursleys. (laughs) Pretty much. That's where I'm going with that. Yeah, that's yeah, that tracks. I just kind of really want to give the Dursleys a piece of my mind. Just want to let them have it. I mean, I'm not saying I don't want to do that part, but both situations suck balls. I'd rather die a wizard than live with the Dursleys or a witch in our case. (laughs) Basically, exactly. So as he and Hermione get up from the table, he notices Cedric leaving too. And it occurs to Harry that Cedric is the only champion who doesn't know about the dragons because he's assuming that Madame Maxime and Karkaroff told Fleur and Crumb, which you know they did. Yeah. He tells Hermione that he'll meet with her later and hurries after Cedric. By the time he catches up, he's with his sixth year friends and he's just like, I'm not doing this in front of his friends. His friends are jerks. Mm -hmm. So he aims his wand and carefully says Defindo. Which was our trivia question. Yep. I like it. (laughs) Such a devious way to get somebody alone. I know. It's very sneaky. Yep. Cedric's bag splits open and his school supplies spill everywhere. It's so dickish. (laughs) You know what, though? I'm not saying he didn't deserve it. But he might have deserved it a little bit. He sends his friends on their way. And once Harry and Cedric are alone in the corridor, he takes this opportunity to be like, dude, first task is dragons. Mm -hmm. And Cedric looks shocked. Like you do. Naturally wants to know how Harry found out. Like you do. (laughs) Harry just says, never mind. Like he does. But explains that he's positive Fleur and Crumb already know too. And Cedric's just like, why are you telling me? Because he's not a dick, Right, he's like, I might be a dick of enough to like split your bag, but I'm not going (laughs) to let you face a dragon unknowingly when all of your competitors know. Right. Like that's just shitty. A bag can be fixed. Who's going to sew you back together after the dragon thrashes you? Right. Who's going to unchar you? Like, dude, come on. I don't suck. So he puts them on even footing. But then they're interrupted by Professor Moody, who sends Diggory off and goes, Potter, follow me. The loosely corresponding movie scene picks up here, starting out on a close-up of a student wearing a badge that says Cedric Diggory, before it spins and changes to say Potter stinks. Because kids are dicks. Harry's trying to make his way through the hall, but is continuously jeered at as he walks past. Because kids are dicks. (laughs) Everyone, like we said, is being a dick, but no one is really all that witty. So while annoying, it doesn't get him riled up like they want it to. He doesn't respond for the most part, aside from a sarcastic thanks here and there. And let's be honest, he's probably also making a mental list of who not to save the next time the world is in danger. So, (laughs) because I mean, that's what I'm doing. Right. And we've talked before about how in movies you can't see Harry's inner dialogue. Mm -hmm. So I think that this was a really effective way to show how much Harry was struggling with the way his schoolmates were treating him. Yeah. We don't see anybody supporting him, aside from Hermione, really. 
So and in the movies, she's not that supportive. She's not there. Every time we see her, she's with Ron. True. Yeah. And the book really makes it seem more like she was on Harry's side. Yeah. It's all super fucked. The book included it in more of a narrative way, but the movie just flat out shows the way Harry's treated, which is pretty shitty. He attempts to walk into the courtyard, but is blocked by a pair of Hufflepuffs, Hannah Abbott and Ernie McMillan. Ernie, king of witty insults as he is, shoves the badge in Harry's face and asks if he likes it, and Hannah just laughs. Harry holds back from force-feeding the both of them his knuckles and simply says, excuse me, so he can be on his way. When they continue to stare and laugh, Harry says, fuck this noise, and pushes past them. As they watch him walk away, Harry heads to where Cedric is lying on a bench, surrounded by his friends, who are also all wearing badges. So, this is very different from how the book had it. But my only real issue with this part is that, sure, Ernie can be pretty pompous, but I really didn't like Hannah Abbott being such a dick. I agree. The bitch face that she makes when Harry walks past her, I'm like, it's so un-Hufflepuff. And it's un-Hannah Abbott. Not that we know a lot about her, but... But come on, her name is Hannah Abbott. It's like someone with the name Carly. How could they be rude ever? They can't. No, they can't. They are total support badgers. Mm Mm-hmm. And Hannah Abbott is a goddamn support badger, and I don't like that's how they painted her. But yeah, she's supposed to be a support badger. And I mean, I'm sure that they have bad days, but I don't think they'd be bullies. Everyone has bad days. Yeah, and they were just full-on bullies in this scene. Yeah. Even Ernie wasn't a bully. He was just kind of a pompous idiot. Yeah. Also, despite achieving the purpose of Harry getting Cedric alone to tell him about the dragons, this was nothing like what happened in the book. (laughs) Nope, not at all. No Defindo, no book bag tearing, no spilled school supplies or making Cedric late to class. None of that. He just quickly sits up when he sees Harry and agrees to have a word with him privately while his friends continue taunting Harry with literal schoolyard insults. It's just much more direct. Yeah. Harry leads him away to a more private area of the courtyard as the taunting continues. Taunting, which Cedric doesn't explicitly join in on, but certainly doesn't seem to admonish in any way. Yeah, he almost comes across amused by it. Oh, yeah. Which he probably was. Well, you're the big man on campus. The little kid stealing your thunder. Yeah, you're the original Hogwarts champion. I don't know, like... I can see how it would go to his head, but again, he's a Hufflepuff too, so it also makes me sad. And it wasn't quite like that in the book. Mm-hmm. It's <laughs> shocking. <laughs> but once alone, Harry faces Cedric and says the one word that can get anyone's attention. Dragons. That would do it for me. Mm-hmm. And Hagrid, too. Definitely Hagrid. <laughs> <laughs> he tells the older boy that they have a dragon for each of them to face for the first task, and Cedric looks shocked, but gets slightly distracted by one of his friends shouting for him. He asks if Harry is shitting him, and Harry responds that he's dead-ass serious. And when Cedric asks if the others know, Harry confirms that they do. As they are talking, we see Mad-Eye Moody watching the exchange from across the courtyard using his magic eyeball to zoom in on Harry and his supersonic hearing to drop some eaves. So, like in the book, Moody clearly overhears, or Mm -hmm. at least magically sees Harry tell Cedric about the dragons. I don't know if the magic eye has a microphone or something, too. Well, he has that magic hearing, so... I guess. (laughs) Bionic eye, bionic ears, bionic leg. But unlike in the book, he does not interrupt them. Instead, Cedric's friends continue to call for him, and Harry starts to walk away, feeling no need to continue this cozy little chat. He stops Harry when a crisis of conscience hits him, and he lamely says that he has asked people not to wear the badges, which I think we can all agree is bullshit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Like I said, he almost seemed amused by his friend's shenanigans. Uh-huh. He never told them not to wear the badge. He was secretly just like, he, 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 he. <laughs> Exactly. Harry tells him not to worry about it because, you know, here's a stand-up guy. And he walks off when he sees Ron and Seamus walking by. Seamus is being his usual pyromaniac self, telling Ron that he doesn't try to blow things up. It just happens. And either way, fire is cool as fuck. Plus fire pretty yeah harry marches up to ron and calls him a right foul git and that ladies and gentlemen is how you insult someone harry knows harry knows (laughs) ron asks if he thinks so 
Harry says he knows so, and Ron asks if he has anything else to say. So Harry ends things on a high note by telling Ron to stay away from him, despite the fact that he's the one who approached in the first place. (laughs) Ron says fine and pieces out. It's a really weird exchange. (laughs) And none of that happened in the book. Though it did serve to reiterate how the two boys weren't speaking since we didn't really get any other narrative about it. Yeah. As already mentioned in the book, Harry and Cedric are interrupted by Moody and Harry is taken to the professor's office worrying that he's in trouble. Instead, Moody quietly tells him that he did a very decent thing. Now, this is where the movie deviates away from the corresponding aspects of the chapter. Though it does include a scene that corresponds with a section of a previous chapter, so it still corresponds, but also doesn't. I feel like that sums up this entire book movie. Pretty much. It still corresponds, but also (laughs) doesn't. (laughs) I mean, that should be on the DVD cover. It still corresponds, but also doesn't. It is this season's tagline. (laughs) (laughs) Can we have a long title this time? It still corresponds, but also doesn't. I think it's going to have to be. (laughs) In this scene, a drawling voice calls out asking Harry why he's so tense. And we see Nazi von Douchebag II sitting in a tree with all the ease and comfort of a woman riding a horse side saddle. Is that comfortable? Exactly my point. (laughs) (laughs) He just looks so awkward up in the tree. He tells Harry that he and his father have a bet going, and he doesn't think Harry's going to last ten minutes in the tournament. And this does actually reference the comment that Nazi von Douchebag II made towards Harry at the start of Care of Magical Creatures class in Chapter 18. Mm -hmm. Though the movie takes it a step further. As Malfoy jumps down from the tree, we see all of his cronies gathered around the trunk in what is the most awkward hangout sesh since everyone sat on the same side of the table at the Last Supper. (laughs) Did you ever hear that joke? What did Jesus say at the Last Supper? No. Everybody on this side of the table so you can be in the picture. (laughs) It's the only excuse for it. Right? (laughs) But then he goes on to tell Harry that Nazi von Douchebag the first disagrees because he doesn't think that he'll last five minutes. All of this said without a hint of irony that Draco couldn't even last 20 seconds with a hippogriff. You mean a bloody chicken. (laughs) Yeah. Instead, Harry just firmly states that he doesn't give a damn what Malfoy's father thinks, telling him he's vile and cruel and Draco is just pathetic. Like you said, Harry knows how to insult. Mm Mm-hmm. Dropping the mic, he turns to walk away, but once again, being able to dish out the dumbass insults, but unable to take a truth bomb or three, Draco reaches for his wand... Before he can cast a curse at Harry's back, however, Moody pops out from his hiding spot and hits him with a spell that turns him into a white ferret. Which already happened all the way back in chapter 13. Yeah. Though I am still really glad they included it. At least it's there. Yes. And it's fairly similar to the original scene, minus the fact that Ron and Hermione aren't there with him. Harry turns around to see Moody admonishing Malfoy for being a little shit and trying to attack someone when their back is turned and punctuating every insult after that with a bounce. Because it's fun to bounce a ferret, apparently. (laughs) It's fun to say bounce a ferret. Right? (laughs) It's fun to bounce a ferret. (laughs) Crab and Goyle stand on either side of the ferret, unsure of what to do aside from watching as their fearless leader moves up and down while Harry loses his shit in the background i mean how do you not though right like those reactions are exactly what harry's gonna be laughing hysterically and crab and goyle being kind of like boulders are just like (laughs) (laughs) what do we do boss what just happened hang on what professor mcgonagall walks up for the most awesome exchange ever she wonders what all the hubbub is about and when he tells her that he is teaching she is horrified but let's be honest, probably secretly amused to realize that the ferret is a student. Is is that a student? (laughs) Technically, it's a ferret. But I mean, yeah, you can't tell me that she didn't wish she could transfigure students, especially Malfoy, when they're being total shits. I almost wish there would have been a scene where McGonagall changes him back into Draco and she goes, oh, it's Malfoy. No, fuck that. Go back. (laughs) (laughs) Like, in my head, that's at least what she wanted to do. 
But this is also where it starts to deviate from the book a little bit. A little. Just a smidge. (laughs) More students, including Cedric and his friends, gather around to laugh at the situation as Moody magics the ferret into Crab's pants. (laughs) How do you not? Right? Come on. It's amazing. Slapstick right here. (laughs) Crab freaks out. Like he does. (laughs) But Goyle thinks this is a great opportunity to cop a feel, so he shoves his hands right in there to get out Malfoy. (laughs) He just wanted to pet the ferret. Yeah, the ferret. That's (laughs) what he wanted to pet. Sure. Mm Mm-hmm. He's obviously surprised when he gets bitten, because obviously that's the first time that anything in Crab's pants has not been happy to see him. (laughs) 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 Womp (laughs) womp. This is definitely dramatized for the film. What? Plus, they really ramped up the comedy as Nazi von Doucheferret didn't end up anywhere near Crab's pants. At least not in this scene. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that we know of. Yeah. Moody winks at Harry as he laughs his ass off with everyone else. Again, how do you not? <laughs> the ferret finds his way out of Crab's pants through the leg and Professor McGonagall steps forward to return him to student form. Which, again, lines back up with the book, as Professor McGonagall was the one who changed him back into human form then, too. Mm -hmm. The ferret spirals back into Malfoy, and he stands up with his wig askew and hurls his catchphrase at Moody as if he gives a shit. My father will hear about this. Was that a threat? Moody lunges towards him, asking if that was a threat. And he chases him around a tree as Professor McGonagall protests. He yells after the retreating Malfoy that he has stories about his father that would curl even his greasy hair, boy. Until McGonagall steps in his path. She points her wand in his face and firmly reminds him that they never use transfiguration as a punishment, pointing out that surely Professor Dumbledore told him that. So, Book Moody was much calmer in his response to Nazi von Douchebag the Second's catchphrase. Yeah. Well, he never had the catchphrase. Like, it was something he said, but mm-hmm. in the book, it was more of a mumbled word my father. There wasn't any specific line that he regularly said. Yeah. But the implication was definitely there. For sure. Movie Mad Eye was much more mad. He really was. Like, not the angry mad, though also the angry mad, but like, dude was off his rocker. Mm-hmm. And just gets right up in his face, whereas he's just like, oh, yeah, I know your father. Mm -hmm. We'll talk. Which I think is scarier. Right? That's what I'm saying, too. So, however, Professor McGonagall had previously stepped in with the same rule reminder about not using transfiguration as a punishment. Mm -hmm. Which is a really interesting rule to have. And I'm super curious as to when it got implemented, since Filch can remember being able to hang kids from their thumbs in the dungeons, and that's fucked up. Surely, transfiguration is not nearly as distressing as that. So maybe it's a newer rule that he didn't know about? Like it wasn't there when he was in school? Or maybe he just didn't care? I don't know. I would think just didn't care. (laughs) But also, I would definitely rather be transfigured into a ferret than hung by my thumbs Mm -hmm. yeah ow i'm also inclined to think that he just didn't care because he reverts to being a five-year-old when he pouts and admits that dumbledore may have mentioned that rule and then makes a face at her back as she shoes away all the still onlooking students super mature totally (laughs) moody then grabs his hurricane and limps past harry ordering him to follow And now the movie is lining back up with the current book chapter that we're on. Mm -hmm. Though in order to do so, it changed how the ferret scene ended. Since in the book, Moody marches Malfoy off to the dungeons to find Snape. Mm -hmm. And in the movie, Nazi von Douchebag II just runs off with his tail between his legs. No, the tail is gone. He's not a ferret anymore. Yep. (laughs) Who knew we would need a time turner more for this book than the last one? Right? (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, Harry hurries after him until they reach Professor Moody's office. Moody limps over to a chair and removes his prosthetic leg, which he usually only does in front of people as a party trick. (laughs) I'm assuming. (laughs) And he sighs with relief like a 30-year-old taking off her bra at the end of the day. It is. (sighs) Harry looks around the office, which seems quite a bit darker than it did when Lupin was in residence. It's filled with many magical objects, and he hesitates when he sees a strange-looking mirror. In the book, Moody invites him to sit down. There's no removing of his leg. (laughs) 
But Harry does and looks around the office, which looks very different from its previous two occupants. Mm -hmm. Moody watches as Harry examines the odd objects around the room and asks if he likes his dark detectors. There's a humming, squiggly golden aerial, and Harry asks what it is, learning that it's a secrecy sensor that vibrates when it detects concealment and lies. Interestingly enough, it's humming at this moment. Mm -hmm. And Moody says, it's of no use at Hogwarts since there's too much interference from students in every direction lying about homework and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why it's humming. And it's all about the whatnot. All about the whatnot. And this is one of those really cool clues that means something and you don't even think that much about it. Right? Exactly. You're like, oh, he brought these dark detectors to school and they're not even useful because students lie a lot. Which they do. They do. It's probably not entirely wrong. However... He also has a disabled sneakoscope and he tells him that that's because it's extra sensitive and it was picking up all sorts of things. Although that could have been more than just students lying. Yeah. Hint, hint, hint. Those are some pretty heavy handed hints. Right? <laughs> but they're so nonchalant. Mm hmm. Just very matter of fact, very yeah. in passing. Right. I dig it. Harry then inquires about a mirror, and Moody tells him that it's a faux glass. He gestures to the shadowy figure moving inside and says that he isn't really in trouble until he can see the whites of their eyes. And that's when he opens his trunk. And he, like, gestures over to this large trunk with seven keyholes. And Harry's just like, what is in that trunk? <laughs> what is in that trunk? Hmm. What indeed? Another thing, totally mentioned in passing. You would not think reading this the first time that that trunk was significant in any way. Right. Well, how often has he been into a professor's office and seen things that literally they're mentioned, but they literally never come back again? Right. So you're just kind of thinking, oh, this is another one of those situations. She's just describing what's in the room. Mm hmm. That's all it is. Yeah. It's very subtle. And it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk more about it when it becomes significant. But before Harry can ask about the trunk, Moody changes the subject and is like, so you found out about the dragons. <laughs> In the movie, there is no mention of the secrecy sensor or the sneakoscope for that matter. But Moody does tell him that the mirror is a faux glass so he can keep an eye on his enemies. If he can see the whites of their eyes, that means they're standing right behind him. And he's like crazy about it, too. Because he's fucking mad. Well, yeah. <laughs> Oddly enough, the only face that can really be made out is Moody's own face. But there's also a female face and one that looks like Barty Crouch Sr. Hmm. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. And it's a little bit different the way that I pictured it reading about it in the book to what he says in the movie. Mm-hmm. Because when he made the comment about the whites of their eyes, which he does in the movie as well. Mm -hmm. In the movie, he's specifically saying they're standing right behind him. In the book, he just sort of, and that's when he opens his trunk. So it didn't make me think that they were standing right behind him or anything like that. It made me think that like these were his foes and they were on to him in some way. Okay. So I just kind of imagine it being a mirror of like, these are the people that are a threat to you. And the picture became clearer and clearer as they became more and more of a threat, which could mean right behind him. Mm -hmm. I kind of took it both ways. I didn't think that it necessarily meant that they were like right behind him physically, but like onto him. Yeah. Was how I would take it. Yeah, definitely. They're interrupted when an ornate dark metal trunk starts to shake and scream. Moody rolls his eye and tells Harry he won't even bother telling him what's in there because he wouldn't believe it if he did. And boy, is that punchline a slow burn. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> All right. So both the book and the movie mention the trunk at this point, but it's in different ways. Mm -hmm. And they even look different. Like the movie trunk did not look what I imagined from the book description. Yeah. Though I feel like we're used to that by now. In the movie, Moody just cuts to the chase and asks what Harry is going to do about his dragon. And Harry's like, the fuck? How do you know? He stammers and babbles, but has pretty much no goddamn clue. So Moody kicks his stool forward with his still-attached leg and tells him to sit. Which is different from the book. 
For one thing, he had invited Harry to sit. For another, he brings up knowing about the dragons much more casually. First mentioning, like, so you found out about the dragons. Mm -hmm. Harry tries to explain that he didn't cheat, but Moody's unconcerned and he's just like, I've been telling Dumbledore from the beginning that Karkaroff and Maxime will not be as high-minded as he is. Mm -hmm. Like, you know about the dragons and you're not going to say anything, but if they find out, they will. Yeah. Because they want to win. They want to prove that Dumbledore is only human. Which are details not mentioned in the movie. Right. But then he asks Harry if he has any idea how he's going to get past a dragon. And when Harry says no, he tells him to play to his strengths. Harry's just like, I don't have strengths. I suck at life. What are you talking about? (laughs) And Moody's just like, excuse me, you've got strengths if I say you've got strengths. (laughs) Wait a minute, when did this become me and you talking? (laughs) (laughs) But he's like, think about it. Dude, what are you best at? Mm -hmm. And Harry's just like, well, that's easy. Quidditch, but how's that going to help me? I'm not allowed to have a broom. And Moody's just like, so use a nice, simple spell that enables you to get what you need. (laughs) Think about it. Wait for it. (laughs) Wait for it. And after a few seconds, Harry's just like, oh, Hermione, I need to learn the summoning charm. (laughs) And there it is. Poor Harry. He's so thick. The movie is again quite different, even though it takes him to the same place. Harry does as he's told and listens as Moody explains exactly how fucked he is, as the other champions are way more skilled and will have strategies that play to their strengths. Strategies, you know, beyond Expelliarmus and Prey, for fuck's sake. He does ask Harry what his strengths are, and Harry struggles to answer, but responds that he's a fair flyer. I have a broom. (laughs) Moody says he's heard the boy is better than fair, but Harry points out that he's not allowed a broom. Leaning forward with a twinkle in his mad eye, Moody very casually mentions that he is allowed a a wand. wand. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. You know that scene would have gone on for 20 more minutes of like Moody going... And what do wands do? (laughs) And with your wand, you can cast what? (laughs) And what spell would help you get your... (laughs) What is it that you needed? The the broom. The broom, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) But this is basically the same note as the book, though book moody is a little bit more direct than movie moody was. True. It also completely brings the fact that Harry was struggling with the summoning charm around full circle. Mm Because now dude's got to learn it. Yeah. Movie Moody does not spell things out for him. That we see. (laughs) That we see. (laughs) But this is where we end the movie section. So we're never going to find out if we had to spell it out now, are we? According to the book, (laughs) he does. The book section goes on just a bit more. As I mentioned, he... Hermione! (laughs) <laughs> I'm ready, I gotta learn the summoning charm <laughs> And the two of them practice the summoning charm During every free moment Even skipping lunch Yeah, that's how you know Ron wasn't there Right? <laughs> Harry wants to skip divination to keep practicing But Hermione just refuses to skip arithmancy And Harry's just like There's literally no point in me doing this without you So fine, I'll go to class <laughs> And then he has to listen to Trelawney predict that he's in danger of sudden violent death. And this part has one of my favorite sassy Harry moments. Because mm-hmm. his response is, well, that's good. Just as long as it's not drawn out, I don't want to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I miss sassy Harry. I know. Even Ron almost laughs at this point, even though he's not speaking to him right now. I hate when I'm fighting with someone and they make me laugh. Just... <laughs> It irritates me. But yeah, this would have done it. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. I love that moment. He then spends the rest of the lesson trying to summon small things and maybe even succeeded with a fly, but he's not entirely sure because it could have just been a really stupid fly. Or it could have just been going that way anyway. I'm going to land on this person's hand. That's a good (laughs) idea. Yup. 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 It just needed a break. Right. After divination, he forces down some dinner, which is probably good since he skipped lunch. True. And he and Hermione head back to an empty classroom with the invisibility cloak to keep practicing. Just past midnight, Peeves shows up. And since they're summoning things to themselves, he decides that means that they want things thrown at them. (laughs) 
<laughs> and he just starts chucking anything he can find at them. And I'm so mad. Like, why? Why? This was the slapstick movie. Why could you not include Peeves, who is the king of slapstick? I have one thing to say. Newell! Newell! And secondly, Peeves. Peeves. Not Ed Sheeran. (gasps) Oh, Charlie Weasley. Not. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, moving on. I miss that damn poltergeist so much. Who knew we would miss a poltergeist? By by two in the morning, Harry finally has the hang of the charm and is surrounded by a heap of objects that he had summoned all by himself. Oh, he's got to be such a proud little puppy. (laughs) Hermione is very tired, but a proud puppy owner, very pleased with Harry's progress and thinks he will be fine for the next day as long as he concentrates really hard. She says they better get some sleep and the two head to bed. Nothing like cramming the night before it's due. Something that you would know nothing about. What? I am insulted. I don't know what you're trying to insinuate at all. That you like to cram things the night before it's due? Whoa, that's dirty. <laughs> and yes. <laughs> And you like to leave things for last minute. That that too. <laughs> I really have no defense there. I'll have you know I resemble that remark. It certainly resembles you. Rude. But this is where we will cut the episode or else it will be way longer than I want to edit. It already is. And now that we're at the end of this section, we actually have some returning actors to talk about. First up is Robert Pattinson as Cedric Diggory. We sort of talked about him before, but since all he really did was jump out of a tree, you know, we figured we could probably bring him up now since we've seen him actually do stuff. Yeah. I mean, yay Robert Pattinson. I thought he was great. At the time, like, this was before Twilight, so no right. one... Nobody knew who he was. He was just cute. Yeah. I thought they made him a little too cocky for what I imagined of Cedric, but they kind of fucked up the Hufflepuffs in general, so yeah. that attracts... I would say, I don't really think that was necessarily our Pats' issue. No, like, I would say not. There were definitely times where he came across more humble. Yeah, but few and far between. Yeah, he definitely had more like the way he jumped out of that tree, mm-hmm. the way that he reacted to his friends mocking Harry. and Even the way he reacted to having his name called. The just way like, that he was about putting his name in. Yeah. He was not as humble as I expected from the book. However... That doesn't mean that what Robert Pattinson did wasn't still good acting. Yeah. Oh, I think he did great. And Twilight or not, I will always just see him as Cedric Diggory. So that's that's all it is. Yeah. When Twilight first came out, I was just like, oh, it's Cedric Diggory. Like, mm-hmm. that's what I still think. Right. And I know he would probably love to forget that he was in Twilight. So he definitely would. However, some of the stuff he's gone on to do. Oh, he's has... super talented. Oh my gosh. He is very versatile. He really is. Yeah, but we'll probably get to talk about our Pat more in some of the later films. Oh yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. He'll be there all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers. But speaking of jumping out of a tree, we also saw Tom Felton as Draco Malfoy, a.k.a. Nazi Von Doucheferret. Nice. <laughs> Again, aside from the hair... His hair was absolutely terrible, but you know what? That's not on him. I thought he was a very convincing ferret. (laughs) I could not believe how much he looked like a ferret. He's just like one. It was amazing. Like, he really went method with that. I gotta say. (laughs) No, seriously, he did very well. He was a wonderful asshole in this movie. He is a wonderful Nazi von douchebag and Nazi von douche ferret. Definitely. And... As we've said before, you love to hate him. Yeah. And he brought that across really, really well. He is supposed to be a bully. Mm-hmm. And thankfully, I think his attitude towards Harry was still worse than Ernie and Hannah's. Yeah. And even like Cedric's friends. So he still takes the cake on that. Mm-hmm. No, if nothing else, I feel like he was spurned on by them. Yeah. Like, oh, hey, they're being dicks too. I'm all, okay. We'll go ahead and ramp it up. And I love Hold that. Hold my beer. <laughs> Hold my butter beer. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And he went with it. Tom Felton, he really went with it, and he sounded great, and I loved it. So, well done again. We love you, Tom Felton. 
We also saw Jamie Waylett as Vincent Crab. Which, I mean, all he really had to do was pretend there was a ferret in his pants, but it was so funny. He has some great facial expressions. He does. They don't give him the opportunity to show them all the time, but he got to use them like when he had to do the scene where he was pretending to be Ron, pretending to be him. Yeah, definitely. And you could see it a lot then, but this was another scene that really showed just how like... The, what he can do with his eyes, especially. Yeah. There was definite fear in those eyes. It was convincing. There was a ferret in his pants. I felt bad for the kid. <laughs> that poor little boy. As I laughed at him. Right? I mean, it was funny, but I felt bad. When they had that deleted scene in the beginning of the movie where they're all singing the school song. Oh, yeah. And he, he was, was singing. so into it. Oh, he was so animated. He's very animated. It. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's great. Lastly, we saw Josh Herdman as Gregory Goyle. Weirdly, I love Goyle. I- and again, didn't get to do much except for like shove Reach. his hands into his friend's pants. And I love like even the look on his face because you can almost read the nuance of like he does it without hesitation. But it's like then he realizes what he was doing as he's getting bitten. And it was just right. like so much went over his face mm-hmm. in that moment. And it wasn't even really happening. Yeah. Like that was some pretty good acting. There was not really a fair in his pants that bit him. <laughs> he had to pretend Wait. all of that. Wait, there wasn't? What? <laughs> I know, shocker. I'm sorry to ruin the magic for you. That's but. crazy. My favorite part, though, was the face he makes after he gets bitten where he's like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, it was great. It was wonderful. We love him as well. This week, we ended up with two Potter Ponderings. Yay! And the first one is, would you rather hang out with the Dursleys or face a dragon? Ooh. Okay, Barty Crouch. <laughs> That's what I was going for. <laughs> And when do you think the rule about not using transfiguration as a punishment was first implemented and why? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. We really look forward to reading them. This will bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Elise Scott. She writes, I'm a Ravenclaw. I was sorted into Hufflepuff recently, but chose to stay in Ravenclaw. My wand is fir wood, 14 and a half inches, solid with a unicorn hair core. My Patronus is a ragdoll cat. I was 12 and picked up the whole set at a book sale. Finished the first one, got sorted on Pottermore, but fell out of love with the second and it just sat on the shelf. Fast forward to 16, I read them all and loved them. My favorite movie and book is Prisoner of Azkaban. My favorite character is Nymphadora Tonks. I collect the different books whenever I find them. I've got first editions, British editions, and the books in Spanish. I also love collecting merchandise as well. I chose to read the books first, even though I had the movies, because in my opinion, books are always better than movies. My entire family got into Harry Potter because of me. Grandma, sister, dad, mom, and aunt. Aww. Thank you so much for sharing your Sorting Hat story, Elise. I love that you have the books in Spanish. That's on my list of things to get because I'm trying to learn Spanish, and I think that would help. Yeah, thank you very much. And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else that you might want to share with us. Or you can just message it to us over social media. Yep. And now for this week's trivia question. We are actually giving you a multi-parter this week. List the champions and the dragon that each one of them faced. The first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word hashtag first task will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. Make sure to check out our website at justkeeprolling.com and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you would like to help us continue creating more content, you can support us as a patron and get extra perks on patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about the second half of Chapter 20, the first task, and the corresponding film scenes. 
Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just, just keep, keep rolling. rolling.